Oh, welcome back, or welcome to the show, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I said moments ago I was going to go over the Sri Lanka thing. Uh, I'm obviously no expert. I do not have the the uh, subscribers to say I'm an expert. Uh, anyway, uh, if you do want to subscribe because you think I'm an expert, or because you like you like how I say how I describe MMT, then please do. Uh, much appreciated. Otherwise, uh, check out rootprogressives.org uh, slash donate slash volunteer slash just uh, look them up and look around and see if you like what you see as far as the part goes. Anyway, so I kind of need to go over what uh, modern monetary theory is. Again, this is from Investopedia. Uh, MMT is a heterodox. What is a heterodox? Let's go find out what that is. Uh, let's see, what is a heterodox economy? And this is why people, you know, anti MMTers tend to go after it. Uh, heterodox eco uh, economy, uh, economics is the analysis and study of economic principles considered outside of the mainstream or orthodox schools of uh, economic thought. Schools of heterodox, heterodox eco economics very widely. They have a few common characteristics other than propounding theories, assumptions, or uh, method methodologies that fall outside of a of or con contradict the mainstream Keynesian and neoclassical movements. Now, you have to remember, we are under the Keynesian or neoclassical movement of economics right now. Meaning, anybody and everybody who has learned how to be successful in those things are the ones who go after modern monetary theory, or those who think that modern monetary theory are the reasons for certain countries going down when uh, there's quite a few things that are involved in those countries' crisis that, have, that are contrary to what MMT actually states. Uh, like, for instance, uh, France being a part of the euro. A MMT here believes that if you you have to be the issuer of the currency, not the user, in order to you know be able to pay your debt, as far as being a, a government a government entity goes, like the U.S., the U.K., um, Canada, Japan, those places, they control their own currency, they control the interest rates, they control. Uh, how the Congress or the parliaments or wherever have you control the money, the money spending portion of the, those economies. Uh, France, they may, I think they may um, control the, the amount of money to a certain degree, but they don't, they're not in charge of where the money comes from. That's the uh, European Central Bank. It's just like the Fed is here, that sort of thing or not. Anyway, yeah. So let's see. Da, da, da. Heterodox schools of thought uh, include far left theories such as socialism, Marxism, and post Keynesian uh, economics, uh, as well as those associated with ra uh, radical free market uh, economics, such as the, the Austrian school, heterodox. Uh, Economists often employ research methods of tools that originate in other disciplines such as psychology or physics to uh, economic questions. Heterodox uh, economists refer to all the various theories and schools of thought that are outside mainstream Keynesian and neoclassical approaches. A wide variety of, comp of uh, competing and conflicting uh, economic schools of thought can at any given time be classified as heterodox uh, economics, though their ideas may eventually enter the mainstream, which we're actually kind of seeing it just a little bit here and there, but the wrong people are in charge of the money in regards to that. Uh, heterodox economists play an important role in developing new ideas and challenging established schools of economic thought. Heterodox theories such as the, Aust the Austrian business cycle theory or ABCT and Minsky's financial instability uh, hypothesis rose to public prominence during the Great Recession because they, pro they provided powerful explanations and that mainstream theories didn't. 
I'll let you read this. I'll let you read the, the rest of yourself. Let me go back to the, I can find it now. <laughs> Previous. Uh, nope, that's Sri Lanka, but not the same one. Da, 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 da. Okay, I'll do. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Uh, no, there we go. Okay, so let's see. <clears throat> Uh, what is my monetary theory? Now, I just went through the heterodox portion of things. Macroeconomic framework that says monetary sovereign countries like the U.S., U.K., Japan, and Canada, ones I just said, which spend tax and borrow in fiat currency that they control, fully control, are not operationally constrained by a revenue when it comes to federal government, federal government spending. But simply, such a government, such governments do not rely on taxes or borrowing for spending, since, uh, since they can print as much as they need and are monopoly issuers of the currency. Since their budgets aren't like a regular household, their policies should not be shaped by fears uh, of rising national debt. <clears throat> Several other differences also exist between mainstream, uh, monetary, uh, mainstream monetary theory and MMT, the most important being the sequence of events that emerge from loans and deposits and from government spending and taxes. MMT challenges conventional beliefs about how the government interacts with the economy, the nature of money, the use of taxes, and the significance of budget deficits. These beliefs, uh, critics say, are a hangover from the gold standard era and are no longer accurate, useful, or necessary. MMT is used in policy debates to argue for such progressive legislation as universal health care and other public programs for which governments claim to not have enough money to fund. Let's see. Uh, core principles of monetary theory. The central idea of MMT is that governments with a fiat currency system under their control can and should print or create with a few key strokes in today's digital age as much money as they need to spend because they cannot go broke or be insolvent unless a political decision do, uh, to do so is taken. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, some say such spending would be fiscally irresponsible as the debt would balloon and inflation would skyrocket, but according to MMT, large government debt isn't the precursor to collapse that we have led, been led to believe it is. The countries like the U.S. can sustain much greater deficits without cause for concern, and a small deficit or a surplus can be extremely harmful and cause a recession since deficit spending is what builds people's savings. MMT theorists explain that debt is simply money that the government put into the economy and didn't tax back. That's true. They also argue that comparing a government's budget to that of an average household is a mistake. While supporters of the theory acknowledge that inflation is theoretical, a possible outcome from such spending, they say, is highly unlikely and can be fought with policy decision in the future if required. They often cite the example of Japan, which has much higher public debt than the U.S. Now, the difference between us and Japan is, well, actually, more or less, is, is more or less different between us and China. Because China actually, I looked it up today, is actually uh, is the largest manufacturing of goods in the world at 28%. Um, that started in 2010. Uh, they started with cars and materials for cars and stuff like that, uh, such as, you know, like these days, it's uh, semiconductors for pretty much anything electrical, I think, or uh, uh, that involves tech, uh, cars, computers, um, cell phones, laptops, uh, you name it. If it requires a semiconductor, China actually, China has the, I guess you could say, a monopoly of it, uh, of that, of those industries. And since, I think, since our country has actually gone away with a lot of the manufacturing, um, since, all well, since uh, the late 90s, I think, um, this country uh, hasn't, didn't, doesn't really have much of a, uh, of a tech supply chain. Now, it seems like Intel will be coming in here shortly to bring more tech uh, manufacturing jobs here, which is good. Uh, but that's one of the things that 
uh, has inflation blowing up is because we, we don't have a robust supply chain. And actually, a lot of economists, uh, if you see on TV, they talk more or less about uh, you know the too much money being put into the economy and you know stuff of that nature. They almost never talk about the uh, the current uh, supply chain constraints because. They don't want to talk about the supply part because they want to be able to have less spending, uh, more more taxes for the people who can't really afford them, and they don't want to have any of their money, you know, be put in jeopardy. But then also a lot more like hedge funders and <clears throat> CEOs, people who actually benefited from the supply chain disruption, so, uh, who benefited from price increases in the in the overall market. Um, and even now, they're actually calling for the Fed to not, um, to not uh, bring up interest rates, which is funny because when, when this whole thing first started, they were doing nothing but asking for or telling the Fed they should raise the rates of interbank loans. Basically, Money that is being loaned to to uh, to banks inside the the, the monetary system for an overnight rates uh, stuff of that nature. Uh, now they're saying they don't want it because I mean, either way, if you look at it, uh, interest rates were meant to stifle loans, stifle spending. And actually, in, and the only way that will happen is that the supply chain was up and running. Uh, there wouldn't be the surprises. The surprises, excuse me, the prices would be down because there would be more inventory, and companies would be forced to bring down uh, their prices at the stores. Uh, gas would, would be lower than it is now. We actually had a reserve of gas, but Donald Trump, uh, in his infinite uh, unwisdom, wisdom, decided to start selling that uh, internationally. And there was a and not to cut this, but uh, uh, there was a text that I that I had been uh, sharing for not text, excuse me, uh, a um, a uh, tweet. Uh, he bragged about uh, he, he bragged about uh, telling uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, and Russia uh, to uh, to cut back on their oil production because that would make oil skyrocket. Mostly because of the fact he knew that since we have a reserve, he could sell that overseas and make some money for you know for the big oil here. When in reality, what we should be doing is actually cutting ourselves off the oil a little bit because we already know that eventually oil in this planet will be either overheated or there'll be supply there'll be a gas and oil shortage, which means that if we were already on you know, renewable energies, solar and wind power. And by the way, just so, you know, you might be thinking, well, what if the power goes out as far as the, as far as those things go? Well, no, there too, also, there's upper, there's batteries that are also out there big enough to be able to hold, you know, electric uh, that are renewed, uh, are from renewed energy. Um, anyways, the point being there is uh, that would actually be a way of getting off of fossil fuel and have fossil fuel being like the last resort for energy. It said the first, uh, the first line of energy uh, that we use. Anyway, so the point being is places like Sri Lanka, uh, they, one of the things that MFT says is you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't take, borrow money from out, from outside countries and outside uh, uh, that uh, from outside uh, borrow from outside your currency, you know, you know, from outside of a currency you don't control. And that's what happened, I think, in Sri Lanka. They took out loans from China, Japan, um, IMF. They still, they currently have a, uh, uh, they're currently restructuring that deal. And, um, oh, somewhere else, um, the money markets, you know, like more, there's more uh, short-term loans to money markets than they are from China and other places. And in fact, um, certain, I mean, China, China had to pull out of uh, their U.S. their uh, U.S. Treasury holdings here because they were losing money because of the whole economy in uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, so that they don't have to spend more than they have to as far as upward goes. I mean, China's had no inflation really uh, because they <laughs> they sell more product than they, than they buy in. 
uh, hence the reason why they're 20% of, of, uh, of the world's uh, manufacturing. So they sell more than they buy. We buy more than we sell, and it seems like. That's why we have such a big de uh, uh, export deficit, or import deficit, uh, a export-import deficit. That's why, because we, we, we buy more than we make. Um, and that kind of goes with the GNP, which is, uh, uh, oh, shoot. GMP is the uh, uh, it's, it's a national product. I think it's a, the general national product. Said that, that anyway, I'm kind of getting that part wrong. I'm still learning very much so as far as MMT goes, but I had the general gist of it. Just my communication is not very good. I see it's um, GDP, gross national, oh, gross national products. But anyway, I told you sometimes my communication is not very good. Anyway, as you can see from my subscriber pool anyway um and for those who are sticking around thank you i appreciate it i hope that you continue to do so and i hope that you tell your friends and family whomever else they may want them to learn how this uh the fiscal world really really uh really goes anyway so let's see a government money creation according to mmt the only limit that the government has when it comes to spending is the availability of real resources like workers, construction supplies, when uh, etc. When government spend, spending is too great, with respect to resources available, inflation can surge if decision makers are not careful. And that's what happened here because our supply chain was not there because we let China and other places take over that take over those because it's uh, cheaper to make and you can sell for the for the same or more prices or you know for the same more profit here. It was taxes create an ongoing demand for currency and are a tool to make or to take money out of an economy that is getting overheated, says MMP. This goes against the conventional idea that taxes are primarily meant to provide the government with money to spend to build infrastructure, fund social welfare programs, etc. What happens if you are if you were to go to your local IRS office to pay your taxes with actual cash? Wrote Warren Mosler, the same old thing. Uh, I, I do recommend the seven deadly innocent frauds of economic policy. Uh, basically, he's saying that uh, you pay your taxes with actual cash, wrote MMT pioneer and American economist Warren Mosler in his book. The, as I just said, first you would hand your money over and your, your pile over uh, currency to the person on duty as payment. Then they'd count it, give you a receipt, and hopefully a thank you for helping to pay for Social Security interest on national debt and the Iraq war. Then after your taxpayer, after the after you, the taxpayer left the room, they'd take that hard-earned cash you just forked over and throw it in the shredder. MMT says that government doesn't need to sell bonds to borrow money since there is the money since that is the money that it can create on its own. The government sells bonds to drain excess reserves and hits and hit its overnight interest rate target. Thus, the extent of bonds, which Moser calls savings accounts at the Fed, is not a requirement for the government but a policy choice. Unemployment is the result of government spending too little while collecting taxes. According to MMT, it says these looking for wait those looking for work and unable to find a job in the private sector should be given minimum wage trans transition jobs funded by the government and managed by the local community. This labor would act as a buffer stock to help the government control inflation in the uh, economic uh, in the economy. Excuse me. We are back. How do I feel when I'm alone? You know, sometimes when I'm alone, you can get the feeling like I'm doing this by myself. The more that you have the confidence to do things alone and persevere through things alone, the better person you are and the better time you can have with other people. Ha, <laughs> paper, yeah. I'm Paperboy Love Prince, and I'm an artist, an activist. I think the best way to find your community and find your tribe is just to be yourself. That's easier said than done, but it's really about exploring your interests. The more you get into that, the more you'll find people who are excited about the things that excite you. I love creating a whole futuristic vibe that's never been seen before. Activism is about being active. 
A big part of it too is about reaching the people that are often forgotten about. So that's why we try to use fun methods and creative methods to reach people that the academics aren't reaching. We're the ones that, you know, need to connect with them to actually build this community because we're from this community. My Black feels like the future, and that's a future where anything is possible. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, that was... <laughs> wow, I have another raider. Or someone just played Screamo. Yeah, that's what happened. I think I have another raid, though. Um, <laughs> Andy Attack 2018, thank you for the raid and this and Slayer Music. Thanks for playing Screamo. Um, Hey, welcome back. I hope you liked the commercial. Anyway, uh, the origins of MMT. MMT was developed by Muslim and bears similarities in, to the older schools of thought like functional finance and charterism. Moser first began thinking about some of the concepts that from the theory uh, in the 1970s, when he worked as a Wall Street trader, he eventually used his ideas to place some smart bets at the hedge fund he, he founded. In the early 90s, when investors were, were afraid of Italy were, would default, Moser understood this wasn't a possibility. His firm and his clients became the largest holders of Italian lira denominated bonds outside of Italy. Italy did not default and instead made 100 million in, in profits. Moser, who has a BA in economics from the University of Connecticut, was largely ignored by the academic world when he tried to communicate his theories. In 93, he published a, sem a seminal es uh, essay called Soft Currency Economics and shared it on the, po the post-Keynesian uh, listserv, which is, which is where he found others like Aus uh, Aust Australian economist Bill Mitchell who agreed with him. Support for the MMT grew in large part thanks to the internet, where economists explained that the theory on popular personal and, and group blogs. The idea of a trillion dollar coin was widely discussed, and supporters shared a clip of former Fed chair Alan Greenspan saying, pay as you go benefits aren't insecure because there's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. Political leader uh, like AOC and Bernie Sanders have a spout MMT and economist uh, Stephanie Charlton first came across Moser's idea on the uh, list serve and is now arguably the face of the theory. Served as chief uh, economic advisor to Sanders during his 2016 presidential uh, campaign. The one thing I don't like about this whole, about this last paragraph is the fact that AOC and Bernie Sanders never came out and said exactly what modern monetary theory was. Instead, they backed off and didn't really say anything about it. They both, I think, have said and talked about it once, I think. Anyway, so criticism of MMT. MMT has been called naive and irresponsible by critics. American economist uh, Thomas Paley has said to and its appeal lies in a being a policy uh, polemic for depressed times. He has criticized various elements of the theory, like the suggestion that central money or central bank interest rates should be maintained at zero and said it provides no guidance to countries like Mexico and Brazil and does not take into account political complications arising from vested interest. Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman's view on U.S. debt are similar to many MMT ideologues, but Krugman has been strongly opposed to the theory. In an op-ed the New York Times in 2011, he warned the U.S. would see hyperinflation if it was if it was part in, uh, put into practice and investors refused to buy U.S. bonds. Do the math, and it becomes clear that any attempt to extract too much from uh, 
seniorage, okay, uh, more than a few percent of GDP probably leads to an infinite upward spiral in inflation, he wrote. And in fact, the currency is destroyed. This would not happen um, even with the same, de uh, same deficit if the government could still sell bonds. Michael R. Strain, the resident scholar uh, at the American Enterprise Institute, has argued that MMT's proposal that taxes can be used to reduce inflation is also flawed. Raising taxes would only make a downturn worse, increasing unemployment and further slowing the economy, he said in Bloomberg column. How does MMT differ from mainstream theories of money and banking? The, uh, MMT is falsifiable and a empirical uh, monetary theory that sets out to explain the real world, whereas mainstream economist theory sets out from the model assumptions and then moves to the real world. Critics, however, have argued that MMT is not a true theory because they are, there is no mathematical model associated with it. MMT is essentially a balance sheet approach to macro, macroeconomics that sees government spending accomplished uh, through, main, uh, between, between, through money creation and not through raising taxes. Another major difference is, the, is that mainstream theory uh, posits that deposits create loans whereby MMT suggests that loans are, are with uh, credit deposits. Okay, I suggest that loans are what creates deposits. Well, that's true as far as that part goes. Uh, see, there uh, the deposits create loans. Actually, it's the opposite as far as that part goes. Um, because if someone doesn't have the money to deposit, how in that case, how would it be able to loan? It wouldn't be able to loan. Um, what does MMT say about government debt? Um, MMT argues that government can never run out of money because it can't always create more of of it. As a result, sovereign uh, governments that control their own money, unlike EU members, for instance, can never default on, on their own debt since they can always create enough money to cover the existing and future obligations. How does MMT deal with inflation from money creation? MMT proponents argue that high inflation rates should not occur unless there is full employment in the economy. But if the the government spends too much money, the excess demand will also cause inflation. In either case, MMT suggests that inflation can be curtailed by reducing government spending and raising taxes. Okay, so let's see. Da, 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 da. Strategies to help maximize income. Okay, no, that sounds totally something else. Anyway, uh, that was in that part, and I, I, disagree with the fact that uh now here's the thing every single time there's been a financial crisis of some kind it's been market created or at the very least has been market created via supply chain uh like 1970s you had the oil crisis that was based on the fact that apparently um that the U.S. government was was helping Israel uh when they were in some kind of uh, thing with uh with um the oh shoot um the e was it eua i think it was a united uh, arab empire uh so every producer of gas and oil in that direct in the middle east got together and create opec opec uh said it was not going to sell uh sell um oil to us and so that's that's the uh the the first oil and gas and oil crisis happened uh, so it was supply chain. In fact, every um, except for the final, uh, except for the great financial uh, uh, crisis, um, everything else, every other financial crisis we've had has been supply chain uh, disruption in some way or another. Um, like in this case, supply chain. If we had enough manufacturing here already, uh, creating. The uh, consumer buffer stock, as it were, uh, and prices for consumer products uh, has a better chance of not being as high as they are now. Uh, the gas is going down due to the fact that uh, we are selling less of uh, the reserve oil that uh, we started creating more in the early 2000s. Um, I think Obama actually started doing that part as far as that part goes. Uh, I think his plan at that time was to become energy dependent or uh, uh, energy dependent. 
instead of uh, foreign energy, in, uh, foreign energy dependent. Um, that worked, but he could have also uh, made sure through executive actions uh, that renewable energy uh, would uh, would be to start up. But um, I think a lot of his campaign con contributors uh, didn't want that, so he stifled that. Um, people like Larry Summers, who was the top economic advisor to Clinton, to Obama, um, and to Biden now, I guess. Uh, everything he has said has been wrong, literally. Like during a great financial crisis in 2008, uh, he said that he didn't want to, he, uh, he said that he advised not to, not to give as much money to the consumers as as he as they did uh that turned out to be false he, he we should have gotten a bigger um quote unquote handout because the economy was going down because of the great financial crisis in this case we should have gotten more because well we were hitting the, we were hitting the crisis on two levels one the pandemic and two the supply chain supply chain was down because of the pandemic uh, the only jobs that were uh, being propped up were manufacturing masks and bringing in all kinds of other breathable uh, um, stuff um, or machines, I mean. Um, and uh, so we started doing that, great. Problem is we weren't manufacturing ourselves. Uh, problem with that, um, we didn't have manufacturing sector. In regards to that, um, also, given the fact that we are in a two-fold crisis here, uh, supply chain and financial, uh, that's where we should have gotten much, much, much bigger stimulus packages as far as that part goes. Uh, the $2,000 wouldn't have been enough anyway. And uh, because Trump decided to have a pretty much free, uh, free spend on the, uh, the uh, PPPs, meaning anybody who can just, you know, copy and paste whatever kind of financial um background they have whether it be business or whatever else because could send it in and get like millions of dollars in ppp loans which are forgiven problem is a lot more of that was given to those who who did not need it especially uh, uh companies that were that were linked to um billionaires millionaires or whatever else those people who invest in smaller businesses they got a good cut of that as well because those smaller businesses uh, needed the PPP in order to stay alive. Dep despite the fact that that uh, the top, their top investors were already millionaires, so the so the millionaire class took advantage of the PPP program through their investment uh, companies, um, through the smaller companies that needed that fund to keep it alive. Um, uh, it was, oh, was it David O'Leary? It was O'Leary, one of the Shark Tank uh, assholes. Um, stupid language, but that's how I feel. Um, was talking about that, and yet he was he was saying that other people, the normal person in the economy, shouldn't get more money, despite the fact that he was getting tons of money from the PPP. So were a lot of other billionaires. They were getting quite a bit as far as the bar goes too. Um, anyway. Uh, and also, actually, a lot of a lot of uh, banks in Alaska, from what I looked up, uh, were giving out loans to for more gas and oil exploration. And again, in Alaska, in parts that were not uh, deemed uh, was a public land or private private land. I mean, or some to that effect. Anyway, point being is, MMT has been right on everything, uh, and it goes to. Um, Basically, I mean, if you look at if you look at the makings of all the uh, the financial distress we've had in the past ninety thousand years, I'm getting about ninety thousand anyway. Um, MMTers or someone or some you know someone's who have been prelude to MMT were right about that, and that's another reason why that MMT uh, advocates for job pro and uh, job guarantee programs to. Uh, help with the buffer stock for employment for those who want work and it may or may not actually take out unemployment but unemployment is used as a as a um, economic uh, buffer uh, as, as an economic uh, stabilizer whereas in the job program could be that stabilizer and the only way that inflation would happen in that regard is that there's 
too few goods being paid uh, be, uh, being paid for with too much money. That sort of thing, and that comes with unemployment, or that comes with the with the uh, job guarantee. Anyway, that's what I got for the day. <sighs> um, so yeah, Sri Lanka has nothing to do with MMT is uh, other than the fact it does have the power to print their own money, but they don't have. But they they decided not to. They decided to take take out loans that were not in their own currency. They they did the opposite of what MMT says to do. Uh, and because of the pandemic, their uh, export business has been kind of done. Same thing with importing. Uh, the only things I think they've been importing are vaccines and shit like that. That doesn't I don't know if that's helped anybody there, but anyway, so that's, that's one thing I know that they've been importing uh thanks for watching listening subscribe share comment be civil a little bit and um have a good weekend peace out for now hey welcome to the show uh my fourth attempt at doing this just so you know um just be transparent um i'm gonna be talking about a little bit about sri lanka here pretty soon but uh i think i just kind of start off with playing some um uh warren mosler l round array and what uh a uh what conservatives should why even even conservatives uh should support uh job guarantee and this was put put up by the depths owl which i recommend you following them on, on uh well pretty much any platform they're on anyway so uh here's a a what a seven minute clip of um Warren and I uh, both talked about this. Uh, he, he's been on the campaign trail, so he's had probably even more uh, immediate interaction. But whenever I presented this idea, and I presented it at a number of conferences, a lot of uh, speeches, I, I presented it once when I was in a debate with the uh, former governor of the Bank of Canada. And actually, it got a surprising degree of what I would call, call bipartisan support. Um, um, I think, as Randy said, a, a lot of people on the right like the idea that you you know, you, you can um, legitimize government expenditure via work, um, and actually, uh, especially when you sell them on the idea that it makes it's not that we want to eliminate welfare, but if you say that it makes welfare redundant because you have this program in place, but it does actually tend to command a lot more appeal. Funnily enough, that a lot of times I get the uh, I've had objections from, from unions <laughs> rather than, than on, on, the, on the right because the unions think that what you're trying to do is create a, a slave class of labor that's going to undercut their wages and you, you try, to, try to explain that you're trying to fill the gap and then create a full employment pool which ultimately enhances their pricing power. So, so in the first thing, this is one of our winning ideas which actually could um, um, get a much greater political acceptance than you think. Every monetary system uses a buffer stock policy. A gold standard is a gold buffer stock. Unemployed, unemployment is an unemployed buffer stock. What we're saying is an employed buffer stock is far superior to an unemployed buffer stock and far superior to a gold buffer stock. It's larger, deeper, more flexible, and most important, whatever your buffer stock is, is always fully employed. There's always a bid for the buffer stock. On a gold standard, gold is always fully employed. You can always take an ounce of gold and sell it to the government and get money. You can always monetize it. In a wool buffer stock where Bill started, there's always a bid for wool, okay? Sheep were fully employed. And so, uh, no, it's true. So right now, we use unemployment as a buffer stock. This is like, clearly shows we don't have any idea what we're doing. Not only do we not understand the monetary system, we don't understand that, well, it's part of it. We don't understand a buffer stock always anchors a monetary system. So we should be using an employed buffer stock. I wanted to uh, correct a misunderstanding because a lot of people do jump to this, that we're going to guarantee that a job offer for anyone who's ready and willing to work. And then they say, oh, so they'll never get fired. No, we never said that. They don't show up, they show up drunk, they don't do their work, they're fired. Okay, anything that a private employer can do to the, legally do to their employees, the employers in this program will do, okay? And, uh, and ju just socialism, I think if you tell most Americans what we're gonna do is we're gonna require that uh, people who ought to be working, okay, define uh, disabilities, um, uh, I think very narrowly, um, they're gonna have to work instead of welfare. And you ask them, what would you call that system? All Americans are gonna call that, oh, that's capitalism. They wouldn't call it socialism. 
And didn't they already say we converted from welfare to workfare? I don't know exactly what that meant, but wasn't that Gittin's big thing? Well, but without the jobs. <laughs> at, at, a minimum, at a minimum, you have to sell your time, and that has value. And um, look, so we're not talking about the government owning the means of production. We're talking about the government providing for public infrastructure. And public infrastructure is all the things you hire people for, and then you've got this transition pool where you facilitate the transition from uh, back to the private sector, back to the private sector, and that's what this does. How, what, we're 750,000? I think out of the 2 million in Argentina, 750,000 went to private sector employment within two years. People who, who never would have done this before. Was it more than that? Yeah, I think it was more, more like half. Okay, that's, that's enormous. These are people who have never been in a private sector, never held a private sector job. The biggest service this did to the economy, well, one was all, all the direct things, but secondarily, it allowed the economy to expand at very high rates without labor bottlenecks. Okay, so it's it's... It's, a, it's an extreme facilitation of the private sector, where right now private labor does not flow from unemployment to private sector very well at all. It takes a lot of demand pull to get that done, which is to everyone's disadvantage, to detriment of all of us. But the point about uh, the business is that uh, I often give talks to the business community, and they're as right wing in Australia as they are here. And I do, and I've given talks in the Netherlands, they're as right wing as they are, and in South Africa and, and uh, elsewhere. And what I say to them, and it's Warren's point, I ask them the question, uh, they're all in suits and what have you, and I say, well, where are the unemployed now? And it's a question I've never really asked, I don't think. And eventually I get them to admit or understand that the unemployed are already in the public sector. Now you're having debates in Congress somewhere down there or up there, I'm not sure of the direction, about extending unemployment benefits. Well that's, that's a recognition and you'll obviously do that again uh, given the scale of the crisis I would imagine. But in Australia we have unemployment benefits guaranteed. But that tells you where the unemployed are, they're in the public sector. So then I say to the assembled businessmen, typically men, uh, I say, well, what are they doing in the public sector? And I can get them to chant nothing. And then I say, well, are you happy about that? And I can get them to say, no, the bastards. <laughs> and I say, wouldn't you rather them doing something productive in the public sector? And they say, yes. And once you go through this logic, you can, get, you can sneak up on them. And in the end, they become supporters of the job guarantee, doing community-based development work, doing environmental care services, doing aged care services. Because they would rather, their, their ideology and their prejudices would rather see them doing something than nothing. It's very easy to persuade that. I would like to uh, uh, echo what uh, Marshall was talking about. It kind of surprised me and woke, woke me up. I have. I have right-wing friends, I'm sure you do too, but this one thing that does echo with them, put them to work and they'll pay taxes. And believe me, they, they agree with me on nothing else and they think it's a good idea, believe it or not. Uh, you know, people say to me, well, what happens if someone wanted to, liked working in the job guarantee? And I said, well, what's wrong with liking your job? Sounds to me like a good thing if you actually settled in the job guarantee for life and made it a career move. What's wrong with that? Most people won't do that, but others, some people might. And then it's up to the private sector to restructure their, their job, jobs and their wages and conditions offer to, to make themselves competitive. What's wrong with that? That's going to increase productivity.